Amen, amen, amen. Wow, Heritage Day. Isn't it awesome? Thank you so much for playing along, uh, coming and celebrating culture today. Amen. Uh, I, I had a thought this week that for some strange reason stunned me. I, I don't know if this is the first time I realized it, thought it, whatever. I'm not sure, but this thought stunned me. You know, we always read about heaven, right? And in heaven, there are going to be people from every, every tongue, tribe, language, etc. Amen? Amen? So, are there going to be vendors in heaven? Amen. They're going to be vendors. Are there going to be Zulus in heaven? Amen. Amen, amen. Every single tribe, tongue, nation, etc. That's amazing. Now, a radical thought for me was like, do you know, you're still going to be black in heaven. Hey? Like, for some reason, I thought, like, you know, color falls away, and we're, like, just all, like, you know, transparent or something, you know, <laughs> shining in glory or something. And this week, I was like, wow, God loves our culture so much that even in perfection, in heaven, we're still going to be our color, celebrated, not tolerated, not like, you know, your culture is less than, or, but just celebrated in heaven. That's how God created you. Isn't that awesome? Amen, amen. amen. So sorry for those of you who are hoping to be like a different color in heaven. Um, <laughs> your best bet is like, you know, skin lightening on this side of eternity. <laughs> All righty, let's dive into the Word of God. Amen. It's great to celebrate culture. I'd love us to take a picture after church just of all the different cultures and people. Is that okay? Can we take a moment to do that? Amen. Will I be what? English only. Yo, that's actually a good question. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm going to put an order in now that in heaven I'll speak Kalanga. Hey, how's that? Hey, wow. Thank you, Lord. A new tongue. Amen. <laughs> Woo. Yo, praise God. But the, the amazing thing is that there'll be all those languages, but we'll be able to understand each other. Just like on the day of Pentecost, when people were speaking in tongues in all sorts of languages, but understanding what was being said. Isn't that awesome? Oh, I so look forward to that. Um, <laughs> can I tell you guys a, a funny... Um, since Sunday has got me on this cultural thing now. Um, for, for five or six years, I was um, the campus pastor at Vitz campus. And uh, it was fantastic. Great time leading the students there. And because we didn't have student cards, we had to become friends with the guards and greet them very nicely on the way in and on the way out, smile extra nicely for five years. Um, and... When I left to go plant a church in Boxburg, uh, the Lord, <laughs> the, the, one of the gods um, was asking a friend of mine, and he said, where's that pastor of yours? And he described me, and the friend was like, oh, you mean uh, Temba? And he says, yeah, that guy, you'd always greet me so nicely in my language. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, I am linguistically challenged, Amen. English and tongues, that's it. Amen. And English sometimes not so well. But, um, but just God created a miracle. And um, God loves to communicate to people in languages that they understand, even if we don't. Amen. God is a God of miracles. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that as we dive into your word, that you'd open up our hearts that we can receive everything that you want us to receive. I pray, Lord, that um, you'll keep me on track in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. amen. I don't know if you're saying amen to receiving everything that God had or that the pastor should stay on track this morning. Amen. The latter. You all guys are bold this morning. Amen. <laughs> Guys, this morning I want to talk about the fact that God is calling us to cross the 
line. Cross the line. It's time for boldness. It's time for courage. It's time to go after all the things that God has called us to do. Amen. Last week I shared a bit about preaching the gospel. And preaching the gospel, sharing the love of Jesus with the people around us is a great privilege that every single one of us has. But often, before we even get to sharing the gospel, it feels like we've got to cross this massive line. Amen. We even looked at a scripture where it seems like Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, has a wrestle on the inside of him. He's struggling. He, he, he's trying to give us insight into his heart. Now, reading through the book of Acts, you realize that Paul was a big deal. He was planting churches. He was sending letters to the churches that he planted that became the Bible that we read today. He was a big deal. But beneath all that success and gospel advance, here we see him letting us into his heart just a little bit. And note what he says again. He says, For if I preach the gospel, that gives me no ground for boasting. For necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, if not of my own will, I am still entrusted with a stewardship. What Paul was saying here is that, guys, sometimes I feel like sharing the gospel. And sometimes I don't feel like sharing the gospel. Who can identify with that? Amen? Because sometimes we, we put these biblical characters into la-la land of spiritual perfection. That, that they didn't have any struggles or wrestles on the inside of them. That they didn't like, you know, we think they woke up in the morning and everything was rosy and they walked on water just for practice. No, it was not like that. One of the most encouraging scriptures for me comes out of the book of James. And James reminds us that Elijah, James 5.17, that Elijah was a man just like us. Just like us. When it came to sharing the gospel, they had to cross the line as well. They had to make some decisions to live beyond their own limitations, to live beyond the way that they had contracted the ability of what God could do in a situation. They had to cross the line. In exactly the same way, God is calling us, every single one of us, to cross the line. Do you know that every time you share the faith, there's a wrestle, <laughs> there are challenges that you have to overcome. I remember during my university days, um, as we were starting to do this thing, and uh, I went home for holiday, and, um, and I, I just felt a burning desire on the inside of me to go back to my old high school and preach the gospel at one of their services. Now, problem. My old high school was 100 kilometers from uh, where we live in Bulawayo, Zimbabwe, and... I did not have a car. And so in order to travel this 100 kilometers, I needed to go and ask my parents if I could borrow a car. Sure, son, why do you want to borrow a car? To go and preach, the, to go and do what? You know, this church thing is starting to get out of control. Isn't it amazing how the devil puts people in your life? to try and just reduce your flames just a little bit? That you can be a Christian, but not too much. Talk about Jesus, but not to me. And we all have those people in our lives. So I was wrestling, because I'd, I'd had several conversations with my dad, and I knew that he was not going to be pro the idea. So in wrestling, I started to say, okay, God, 
You're going to have to come through. You're going to have to do a miracle because right now, God is not pro this Christian thing. Praise God, later in his life, I had the privilege of leading him to Christ. But at that stage, it was a wrestle. It was a wrestle. And so I'd be reading my Bible and I came to the book, (laughs) one of the Old Testament books where there's a story of a servant called Obadiah. And and it's such a powerful story because basically Obadiah is called to go do something. He says, oh, please don't kill me. And because he, please, please don't kill me, he gets favor with the king and he's given permission to do what he needs to do for the Lord. So I thought, okay, if the Bible says that, I'm going to speak to my dad. I went, said, hi, dad. I need the keys to the car. No, no, my dad was like, fine, to like, we could use the car, but we needed to account what's happening. So I was like, where are you going? I said, I need to go 100 Ks, high school. And my dad was like, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go and preach the gospel. My dad looked at me and said, okay, here are the keys. Drive safely. And it was a wrestle. You know, before that moment, everything seemed impossible. It seemed like it will never happen. Fast forward the story, got in the car, drove, preached the gospel um, to, to, um, in my former high school, and tons of people got saved, gave their lives to the Lord. We went back rejoicing, hallelujah, praise the Lord, God is good, and all of that. What would have happened if I never crossed the line. Uh, You see, God this morning, he's not interested in us staying on the other side of the line. And there are four things this morning I want to talk about. Because when it comes to sharing the gospel, there are four things we've always got to contend with. Number one, there's a wrestle. Number two, we've got to be a witness. We actually have to share the gospel. And number three, God shows up, and we win souls for Christ. And you know, something happens when people start getting saved, it becomes contagious. And more and more people in the world start to know Jesus. But it all starts with a wrestle. It's time to cross the line. It's time to cross the line. As I was thinking about this sermon, I was reminded of the book of Acts. Because in the book of Acts, the Bible says that there were in the upper room 120 disciples. Jesus had appeared to them, 120 of them. Now, how many of you have had Jesus appear to you? I don't know, must probably some. Yeah, Jesus can appear to you. It's in the Bible. Say so. I will manifest myself to you. Oh, don't you guys know that? John, read it. <laughs> Book of John. Say that. I will come and I will manifest myself to you. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so they personally seen and encountered Jesus and they go to the upper room where they're praying for the Holy Spirit to come. Now there's a tension because they had seen the resurrected Jesus But they were also now still in Jerusalem, the very place where Jesus had been crucified. Do you see the problem? Jesus, resurrected, now ascended, gone to the right hand of the Father. We still here in Jerusalem, the very place you were crucified. God, what's going to happen to us? I think if I was in the upper room as well, I would also be praying with those 120, right? Saying, God, um, we know you love us, we know you're powerful and all, but, uh, you know, you died before you were resurrected. Is that what's going to happen to us as well? Because sometimes we, we think that these were guys who were just like so caught up in the moment that, oh... Jesus is so wonderful, he's so amazing. No, almost probably saying, what's going to happen to our lives? In the book of Corinthians, the Bible says Jesus appeared to over 400 people, but only 120 rocked up in the upper room. Where were 
the other 280 people. They were afraid. They were fearful. Matthew 28, where Jesus gives a great commission. The, the Bible says, some believed and others doubted. Now, hang on, hang on, hang on. You mean, if you saw Jesus crucified and died, and then three days later, risen again, you see him walking through walls, you see all this incredible stuff, while he's walking with them for 40 days after he's resurrected, and just before he ascends, he's speaking to his disciples, and the Bible says, some believed and others doubted. Now, I hope this gives you hope for your situation. Amen? Because even if you start in a place of doubt, God can transition you. Because one of those people at the time of Jesus' crucifixion who was doubting was Peter. And Peter had given up all hope and gone back to ship to fishing and Jesus had to go and fetch him and redeem him and say, it's okay, you denied me three times, it's okay, I still love you. Wow. And then in the upper room, as they're praying and wondering what's going to happen to them, the Holy Spirit comes upon them in power. Tongues of fire on every person's head. Did you hear that? On every person's head. Not just the 11 who had walked with Jesus. And number 12, Matthias, who we only hear about once in the Bible. But all 120 of them had flames of fire coming from their heads. That's because God doesn't just want to use the few, the chosen, the anointed, the platform people. He wants to use every single one of us. So now, filled with the Holy Spirit, they exit the upper room, and the Bible says that they start to speak in other tongues. And as they do that, people stop, a crowd forms, and they're looking at this because everyone is hearing them speak in their own language. And they're looking at this and they're saying, wow, wow, I can hear God being magnified and praised in my own language. And the Bible says, Peter, that same Peter, who had been a coward, unable to even say to a young girl who he really was, out of fear for his life. The Bible says he was the first one to stand up and boldly address the crowd. Do you wrestle with sharing your faith? Do you wrestle with just talking about Jesus? The Holy Spirit is given to us to embolden us beyond our own ability. To give us the ability to become a witness. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. And when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall receive falling down. Isn't that what it says? No, no, it says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive shaking. Are you guys, have you read your Bibles? Because Acts 1, 8 says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be a witness. Guys, I love falling down under the power. I love shaking, all of that stuff. I love it. But that's not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to thrust us out into mission. That's the purpose. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall receive power to be a witness. Watch this. In where? In Jerusalem. Exactly. Because Jerusalem is the place where Jesus had just been crucified. It was the most dangerous place to be a believer. It was the place of the most resistance and obstacles. That is the first place the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon us and anoints us to preach the gospel. Jerusalem. Okay, where else? 
<laughs> God, give me some options here. Sure, Judea. What? Judea? Well, Judea wasn't so bad because they're like cousins of the Jews. Where else, Lord? Samaria! <laughs> hey! Now you need to understand, Samaria, those are people with racial hatred issues towards me. Those are Samarians. There was enmity between the Jews and the Samaritans. And now the guys are thinking, okay, God, is there anywhere else? Is there anywhere else? Judea didn't sound so bad. But I mean, Samaria? No, 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 no. And Jesus said, and to the very ends of the earth. You know, as a believer, we don't have the option to pick and choose. Uh, you know, last week I started to like, you know, just leak a little. <laughs> Keep me together, Lord. Keep me together. <laughs> because I think sometimes we, we, we've bought into a mutant version of Christianity. Paul calls it another gospel. Uh, you, you know, the real thing is not Kool-Aid, guys. Following Jesus is not la-la land. It's not nice times and big houses and fancy this and fancy that. Praise God if you have them, but you have them for a purpose. That's the gospel. You have them, but you have them for a purpose. And so many of us would rather chase other things than what Jesus says. So there's a wrestle. Lord, where do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. Right here in Johannesburg, where is your Jerusalem? The place where you are most hated, where people don't want to hear you talking about the gospel. For some of us, it's our very own families. God wants you to go back to your house, go back to your family, and share the gospel with them to share the love of God with them, to tell them the simple story of what Jesus has done in your life. You know, that's what a witness does. A witness bears witness to what they've experienced, right? Isn't that what the word means, witness? But the Greek word here in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 isn't that kind of witness. It's a word, <laughs> are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Leaking of another type to this week. <sighs> Acts 1 verse 8. The word witness is the same as the English word martyr. It means one who's willing to lay down their life for the sake of the gospel. Yes. I mean, don't you just want power for signs and wonders and all of that kind of stuff? Isn't that awesome? Well, we have power and authority to do exactly that, but this is what we are called to do. We are called to lay down our lives and we need the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to cross the line. Because in our own natural desires and abilities, we don't want to cross the line. Who wants more power of the Holy Spirit in their lives? Mm -hmm. We all do. Because we can't cross the line without Him. That's so important. We can't do this Christian thing without Him. In our own strength, it is impossible. We can't. We're selfish by, by nature. That's who we are. We're selfish. Don't worry, me too. <laughs> Ask my wife. Selfish by nature. You know, when, when uh, Kulani was saying, just like you do at your own house, pick up your cup and throw it in the bin, Kulani, you're assuming too much. <laughs> too much, you're assuming. So, let me give you another example here. Ananias. Ananias in Acts chapter 9. 
He's in, his private, he's in private prayer time with the Lord. You can turn there, Acts chapter 9. He's like, Jesus and me, oh, what a glorious day. He was most probably singing, oh, fa-na-na-ye, oh. You know what I mean? Minding his own business. Dangerous, dangerous place to be in the presence of the Lord. Verse 10, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. This is what the Bible says. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he's praying. And in a vision he's seen a man named Ananias, <coughs> that's you, coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Ananias, being a man of, of great learning and who had read that morning's newspaper, said this to the Lord. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard about this guy. How much harm he has done to your church in Jerusalem. And here, he actually has been given authority in my city from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name, i.e. me. Isn't it amazing when the Lord gives us a nudge, we immediately go into a wrestle? Isn't it true? When the Holy Spirit says, go speak to that person, our immediate... Our, is it just me? Our initial thought is like, I've got 10,000 reasons why I can't do that right now, Lord. You don't understand how busy I am, deadline. Lord, say, I'll pray for someone else. In fact, Lord, I'm even willing, EFT, right now, just tell me who. Tell me who, I'll send the money. And I'll say, it's because I know you're in ministry, brother, and you know, you're doing a good work, hallelujah. But God wants you to cross the line. So Ananias is saying, this guy's soul is not good news. He's been persecuting the church and he actually has instructions to come and put us in prison. What does the Lord say? Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go! For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings and the children of Israel. Verse 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17. And Ananias went his way to go and minister to Saul. I don't know if Ananias thought like, God, I'm not buying this. Until he heard the words, I will show him how much he is going to suffer. <laughs> I mean, if it was, you know, Temba and Ananias, it would have been like, yeah, I can deliver that message, you know. There's some people only like de delivering prophetic messages that have got, you know, some pain in them. Okay, moving right along. And... Uh, <laughs> And so he goes to the house, he lays hands on Paul, he says, Brother Paul, I've come to pray for you, Jesus who appeared to you has sent me, in the name of Jesus be healed, scales fall from his eyes, Saul can see. And we know this, how the story goes. In the wrestling, Ananias becomes a witness, and in the witnessing, a soul is one, Paul is one. And he goes on to reach the world. Guys, you know, we never know who God is calling us to minister to. We never know. We never know. We never know how many people are going to go on and be uh, pastors and do all sorts of stuff around the world. We'll never know the fruit of just sharing the gospel with people. One of the blessings I've had 
uh, was an opportunity to go to Ethiopia. So this is an Ethiopian shirt that I got in 2007. Yep, 2007. And uh, babes, this just goes to show that I, you know, since 2007, um, I don't know what it means. Anyway. <laughs> and you remember, okay, let's delete, the, delete those files. And we had the privilege of going to minister to uh, teenagers who were in their summer break in uh, Addis Ababa. We were in a place just north, 30 k's north of the city called Deborah's 8. And in Deborah's 8, every day we'd be eating our injera. Who's been to, you know that Ethiopian flatbread thing, injera? Um, and it's like very tangy and all of that. So we're eating our injera every day for two weeks. We're ministering to these kids. And uh, the way we'd minister to them is that Every day would like would preach literally the whole day from from nine nine p.m. till nine a.m. till three p.m. Every day would be preaching an hour lunch break in the middle, and at the end of the day, the minister would come to us and say, "Guys, that was great. It was really good stuff you were teaching today. So tomorrow, can you please teach on?" And he would give us a topic, and would spend the whole night preparing for training the whole day that message. And it wasn't like, you know, now, like 2007, I didn't have like iPad and, you know, nice things to carry around. And, you know, it was like, okay, God, let's dive into the Word, let's go minister, let's do this thing. And you know the amazing thing? Even though it was a wrestle, even though it was tough, the fruit it bore was amazing. How many of those young people repented, turned around, gave their lives to the Lord, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, we were ministering in a denomination that didn't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All those kids got baptized in the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost. And uh, <laughs> a couple of hundred of them. Phenomenal. And they've gone on to go and be preachers and ministers all over Ethiopia. You'll never know what God does if you're willing to cross the line. Are you willing to cross the line? Let me give you one more. The next chapter, Acts chapter 10. The very next chapter, we see another luminary of the Bible. Peter, who stood up on the day of Pentecost and did these amazing things. You know what happens? He is on the roof of his house. And he goes into a trance. And the Holy Spirit starts to minister to him. And he has a dream where he sees all these animals. And, the, and a voice from heaven saying, kill and eat. And he says, God, I'm a good Jew. I will not eat anything that is unclean. And again, the voice from heaven comes and says, kill, eat. And he's like, no, God. No pork chops for me. I'm a good Jew. And the third time, the voice from heaven comes and says, Peter, kill, eat. And he's like, God, I will never, ever do that. And the Lord says this to him. He says, do not call unclean what I have called clean. And as he wakes up from it, he's like pondering this. Don't call clean, unclean what I've called clean. But God, in your word you say unclean. And as a Jew, I know I'm not supposed to do certain things. Downstairs, someone knocks on the door. And it's guys from Cornelius' house. Cornelius was a general, like a, like a Roman general. He was an army officer. High ranking. And these delegates come and say, Peter, we were sent by an angel to come and fetch you, to come and minister to us. Naturally, Peter's inclination would be, but they are Gentiles. These are Gentile people. They don't serve God. I've got nothing to do with them. But he crossed the line. And he went to go and minister at Cornelius' house. And because he crossed the line and ministered at Cornelius' house, guys, that's why every single one of us are sitting in this room today. Because he went past his prejudices. He believed that God was bigger than the issues he was wrestling with in his heart. And he went and witnessed the gospel. He preached the gospel to Cornelius. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10 that even while he was still preaching about the resurrection of Jesus, the Holy Spirit fell on them. 
and they started to speak in other tongues. And he looked at his delegation that came with him from Joppa and he said to them, uh, well, maybe we should also water baptize them. Because even while he was preaching, I don't think Peter actually believed that Gentiles could be saved. I mean, read, read the sermon in Acts chapter 10. It's like he's going around the bush like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, Jesus, you know, yeah, it's true. And ah, you guys, I'm wasting my time and all of this stuff. And while he's still preaching, the Holy Spirit can't wait anymore. It falls on them. Who are the people in your world that you think will never get saved? That you could never reach out to? Because it's um, Heritage Day, I want to tell a story of the gospel coming to Africa, and I think it's a good place to land on. We're about to go on a mission to Eswatini this week. It's happening. Amen. And I know you guys are clapping because you think we're superheroes who are going, but we're not. We're ordinary people. And many of us on the team are still wrestling. God, are we adequate? God, we are willing, but will you come through? And just like the Apostle Paul would ask people, say, guys, pray for me. I'm going to go and preach the gospel. Pray for me. Pray for me. Guys, please pray for the mission team. We'll leave on Wednesday. We're back Sunday afternoon, evening, sometime Sunday. Um, pray for us. Pray that the gospel would advance, that God would anoint us. There's a team of about seven of us, um, one from Ramsar, one from Cape Town that's coming, the rest from Every Nation Sunning Hill. Pray for us. Pray that the gospel will go forth. Pray that disciples will be added to the church there. The church has given a strict instruction. They say, guys, we don't just want impressive numbers of so many people got saved. We want them added to the church. So we're like, okay, God, this is a challenge. Give us the strength to do it. Amen. Give us the strength to do it. So this story, let me, let me close with this story. Um, the spread of the gospel in Africa came in three major movements. The first one um, was, was a move of God down through Ethiopia. Another one at a similar time, and historians argue as to which move of the gospel happened first when the Ethiopian eunuch went back to Africa, what happened, and that spread in Ethiopia. But there's another story we don't often hear about. One of the authors of the New Testament was a young man called Mark. You know Mark? You know Mark? And Mark was not one of the twelve disciples. And many people call him the interpreter of Peter. They say that Mark was a young man that took down what Peter was preaching about Jesus and that became the earliest gospel. So historically, when you look at Mark and the character of Mark, it's very fascinating. And I'm, I'm leaning on the work of a guy called Thomas, Thomas Oden here. Thomas Oden, you can have a look online. He's given lectures on this, uh, the history of St. Mark in Africa. So Mark is a young man of Cyrene heritage. Now, where is Cyrene? Now, sometimes we need to locate these places because we hear these names and we're not sure. You know, the Bible says people from Cyrene were there and we're like, oh, great, good for the people from Cyrene. Cyrene is located in Africa, modern-day Libya, that area around there. That's where it is. And often when you see events in the Bible, for example... Who carried the cross? Simon of? A guy from Libya. Day of Pentecost. 
The Bible says that there were people from Cyrene who were there. So on the day of Pentecost and at the crucifixion of Jesus, there were eyewitnesses from Africa. Africa. Ah. Sometimes we forget that Africa is included in this gospel we preach. So, Mark, young man from Cyrene, uh, historians say that he followed Peter around and saw how Peter ministered with mighty signs and wonders following. And one night, Peter gets a dream. And the Holy Spirit says, Peter, there are two places that lack the gospel where you need to go and preach. And he says, God, that's fine. Where should I go? And he says, the two places, one is Rome and the other place is Alexandria in Egypt. So Peter heads off to Rome. Now, those who know their church history know that that is where Peter met his martyrdom. Okay? Peter was martyred. He was killed. But there was still a vision of the Holy Spirit where he said that someone needs to go and preach the gospel in Africa and Egypt. Now, Alexandria and Egypt was one of the power centers of the world at that time. So, young man Mark, who had been close to Peter, Here's the prompting of the Holy Spirit that go to Africa and preach the gospel. So he goes to his home nation of Cyrene. And historians record that he went to five cities in Cyrene with signs and wonders. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me read what it says here. When St. Mark returned from, home, from Rome, he first went to the five cities of Cyrene and preached the word of God. He showed them many miracles. The sick were cured. Those with leprosy were cleansed. And those with evil spirits were freed from them. Many believed in Lord Jesus and broke their idols. He baptized them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wow, so this is early Christianity, guys. This is early Christianity, a few decades after Jesus had resurrected and ascended. And here we see a young man going to five cities and seeing incredible breakthrough and revival. But then he gets a dream at night. And the Holy Spirit speaks to him. And the Holy Spirit says, (laughs) Go and, and preach the gospel in Alexandria. And the Bible talks about how As he's gathering with the believers in Cyrene, he stands up and he says, strengthened by the Holy Spirit. I wonder why he needed to be strengthened. You only need to be strengthened if you are weak. And it says he stood up strengthened by the Holy Spirit and girded himself like a man of war and bade farewell to the believers. And he said, Lord, and this is a phrase he would use, he said, Lord, I thank you that you will make my way easy. I thank you that you will make my way easy. And by that he wasn't talking about easy like you and I talk about easy. No obstacles, no challenges. But he was recording what he says in the beginning of Mark from the book of Isaiah that God makes the crooked ways straight. And what seems to be crooked at first, God makes straight. He makes a highway in the wilderness. Don't be afraid of the wilderness in your resting, knowing that God is going to provide a way out. Amen. (laughs) The plumbing. So he carries on. To Africa. And in the Coptic churches, now the Coptic churches are those churches up in Africa, right? And in the Coptic churches, they teach the children the story of how Mark came to Alexandria in Egypt. And this is the story that they tell to the children as a way of reminding them of how God works. So they say Mark arrived at the gate of the city. And as he arrived at the gate of the city, what happened? His shoe strap broke. 
Now, many of us would have said, ah, oh, that's a sign. <laughs> ah, God, you don't want me. Ah, God, that's a sign you don't want me here. And as his, his, foot, his sandal strap broke, he said this. He said, God, I thank you that you have made my way easy here. He takes his sandal to the closest cobbler he can find. Closest cobbler. A man called Ananias. And they start chatting and says, please can you fix my shoe? And he says, oh sure, it's a joy to work for you. And he takes the shoe and as he takes his instrument, his awl, A-W-L, and as he takes his awl to fix the shoe, it goes through his hand. And he exclaims, Oh, God who is one. And Mark turns to the east and goes, God, you have made my way easy. And the Bible says that he goes and he spits on the ground and he makes a little clay ball, puts it on the man's hand and says, In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be healed. The man is instantly healed. And he starts to have a conversation with him about Jesus. He gives his life to the Lord. And this guy who gives his life to the Lord, Ananias, starts to say, but what about all the idols? And they have a conversation about the idols, the things that he was worshipping. And he says, okay, then I need to surrender these things if I'm to follow this God you're talking about. And Mark says, that is true. And this guy then goes and gets rid of his idols so that he could serve the one true God. And he's learning daily. He's being discipled by Mark. Ananias becomes the first, first bishop of Alexandria. What would have happened if Mark decided to stay behind the line? Where would we be if so many others had chosen to stay behind the line? It's time for us as a church to cross over, to be witnesses, to win the lost and see the world come to Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace. It's time. It's time. Holy Spirit, I ask that you do what only you can do. That you move us. <laughs> that you move us, Lord, to have those conversations. This week it was such a blessing, Lord, to, to go again to a lady who was saved just last weekend to go and give her a one-to-one -one book and to set up an appointment to start a new connect group with her and the others that got saved, just here in Sunning Hill. And Father, we know that there's so much more that you want to do. This gospel is not dead, it's living and active. You're just looking for people who are willing to cross the line. And Father, I know everyone here has got to wrestle. Every single one of us has got to wrestle. Whether it's time whether we feel we don't know it well enough, whether we, we've got so many excuses, but Father, we're willing to humble ourselves and say, here am I. Oh Lord, the good, the bad, the ugly, here am I. Send me. Send me. Oh Father, I ask that you would bless this word in our lives. We can't live this on our own. We desperately need your help. Your loving, tender help. Help us, Lord, to share the gospel in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen, amen, amen. amen. Guys, God bless you. Uh, next week, uh, I will be in Eswatini. Uh, we'll have a tremendous minister here to minister the word. But remember to pray for us. Please, there's fellowship.
and would love to take some pictures with our traditional attire. Amen. Let's have some great pictures and fellowship. God bless you. Have a fantastic week.